Hello, I'm doing a movie review, and the movie I want to review is the 1982 science fiction horror classic, The Thing. Now, The Thing was directed by John Carpenter, who prior to this directed films like Assault on Precinct 13, The Fog, Escape from New York, and of course the original Halloween, which is arguably what he's best known for. And he would go on to direct movies like the Stephen King adaptation, Christine, Star Man, Big Trouble in Little China, Prince of Darkness, They Live, In the Mouth of Madness, Ghost of Mars, and many others. John Carpenter is definitely one of my favorite filmmakers, and he's one of those directors along with people like Wes Craven, Toby Hooper, Dario Argento, David Cronenberg, and of course, George Romero, who really did sort of reshape horror and redefine horror in the 70s and early 80s, and sort of created what we now think of as modern horror. Now, of the filmmakers I just mentioned, I think David Cronenberg might technically be the best of all of them, but if I had to pick a personal favorite, it would be John Carpenter. Now, I have the thing both on V. VHS, and I have it on this DVD set with several other John Carpenter movies. Now, The Thing was written by Bill Lancaster, who prior to this wrote The Bad News Bears and The Bad News Bears Go to Japan. A hell of a contrast right there to go from The Bad News Bears movies to The Thing. He's also the son of actor Burt Lancaster. Now, The Thing is based on a 1938 novella called Who Goes There by John W. Campbell Jr. Now, I have read the book, and I did a review on the book several years ago. Now, prior to this, The Thing was already adapted into the 1951 film, The Thing from Another World, which this movie is technically a remake of. Now, The Thing from Another World is really only a loose adaptation of who goes there. Like, it takes the same basic premise as the John Campbell story, and kind of does its own thing with it, but it's a decent 50s sci Fi movie. My issue with it, though, is it takes what was essentially a body horror story and made it more of a generic monster on the loose story. But it is a good movie, and it's definitely one of the most influential sci fi horror films of the 1950s. And if you consider the time period it came out, and if you're paying attention to the subtext, there's definitely a lot of Cold War allegories in the film. And even before John Carpenter would make his remake, it's clear that The Thing from Another World is a film that had an influence on Carpenter because there are scenes in the original Halloween where The Thing from Another World is playing on television. Now, between The Thing from Another World and this movie, there was technically an unofficial adaptation of Who Goes There in 1972 called Horror Express, which is a fantastic movie, and it's a movie that I grew up on, and I I never even realized that it was supposed to be loosely based on who goes there, but when I thought about it more, there are actually some, albeit very superficial, but there are some connections between the two stories. I mean, they're both about monsters that are discovered in the ice. Granted, in Horror Express, the monster is discovered in a cave in China instead of being discovered in Antarctica, and instead of being set at a research base, the the movie is primarily set on a train where this fossil comes to life and anybody who looks into its red eye is drained of their soul, mind, and memory. But there is sort of this deal in the movie where the creature's essence is spread into other people on the train and they have to check who is possessed by the alien entity at one point. So again, there are some, albeit very superficial, connections between the two stories. Now, the thing, in my never-to-be-humble opinion, is John Carpenter's masterpiece. I think this is easily the best film out of everything that John Carpenter has done, because as much as I do genuinely love most of Carpenter's films, very few of his films would I say are outright perfect. But the thing... 
The Thing is the closest that I could think of to a genuinely perfect horror film. Like, I really don't think there's a false note in this movie at all. Like, everything from Carpenter's direction to the atmosphere to the pacing to the acting and the characters to Rob Bottin's special effects to Ennio Morricone's beautiful score or Dean Cundy's gorgeous cinematography, everything about this movie movie really is perfect, in my opinion. And yes, I know, by calling The Thing a perfect film, I am kind of overhyping it for people who haven't seen it, and now anybody watching this video who hasn't seen The Thing is going to go out and watch it, and you might be disappointed now that I've called it a perfect film, but I will say that by my standards, this is a perfect horror film. Now, even though today the film is lauded by both fans and critics as being a classic of the genre, and today, most people would probably agree with me that this is Carpenter's masterpiece. At the time this came out, this was not well received at all. I don't think this did well commercially, and the critics savaged the film. And I'm honestly baffled as to why people did not like this movie. Some of the criticisms directed against this movie were comparisons to the original The Thing from Another World, which, at the time this movie came out, there were a lot of people who really did grow up with the 1951 film, so when this came out, a lot of people were really disappointed, but it's ironic that this movie is actually a lot closer to the source material than The Thing from Another World is. But there are two movies I think really hurt this film's success. One was Ridley Scott's Alien, because when this came out, there were a lot of unfair comparisons to Alien, and tonally, they are very similar stories. But another was Steven Spielberg's E.T., which I think came out only a few weeks before this, and E.T. was fucking huge when it came out, and I think Carpenter himself even blames E.T. for the thing's failure. Like, E.T. was this cute, heartwarming movie about a friendly alien, and I think at the time this came out, nobody wanted to see a movie about an evil alien. It's stupid, of course, because The Thing and E.T. are two completely different kinds of movies, but again, I think E.T. is one of the things that really hurt this film's success. Now, the plot of The Thing is it's set at an American research base in Antarctica, and one day a helicopter that appears to be from a Norwegian camp comes flying towards the base, and the two men in the helicopter are chasing and shooting at a dog. When the helicopter lands, one of these men accidentally blows himself up with a grenade, and then the other, while shooting at the dog, accidentally shoots at some of the men at the American base, and and he ends up getting shot and killed himself. Now, of course, the men at this base are like, what the hell is going on? And two of them go to the Norwegian base to investigate, and they find the place completely decimated, and everybody who's supposed to be there is either dead or missing. And they also find this body in the snow that appears to have been burnt, and this body doesn't appear to be quite human. And we eventually learn that the people at this Norwegian base discovered an alien spacecraft buried in the ice that appears to have crash-landed there thousands of years ago, and they discovered an alien life form. And it turns out that this dog that the two men were chasing in the beginning was not a dog at all, but was actually this alien in the form of a dog. It turns out that this organism can essentially consume other organisms organisms, and then it takes on the form of whichever organism it consumes. Like, it replicates them, and replicates them perfectly. When it's discovered that the dog is an alien, the men kill it, but this is not the end of it, because this thing can multiply, and again, it can replicate any life form. So, not realizing who's an alien and who isn't, the men start turning on each other, and ultimately, fear and paranoia become the true antagonist of the film. And soon these men, and we as the audience, start to realize that it might already be too late for them, 
And if this thing does make it to civilization, it could potentially be the end of the world as we know it. Now, in the film, Kurt Russell plays R.J. McCready, the film's protagonist. It's definitely one of my favorite Kurt Russell performances. It might actually be my favorite. And McCready is a badass character, but what I really like about this character is even though he is the hero of the film, it could be argued that McCready is sort of an anti-hero. Now, later on in the film, there's a scene where the character of Gary, who is the head of the base, relinquishes leadership when it's suspected that he could be an alien, and then the character of Child steps in and basically volunteers himself as leader, but then McCready intervenes and says, maybe somebody a little more even-tempered Childs. But what's funny about that is... Is McCready as even-tempered as he thinks he is? Because think about it, in the beginning of the film, there's a scene where McCready is playing chess on his computer, and the computer beats him, so he retaliates by pouring his drink into the machine. And then later on in the film, McCready actually threatens to blow them all sky-high with dynamite when the other men suspect that he might be an alien, and he even kills some somebody who turns out to be human. Granted, the person that he kills was coming at him with a knife, so it was in self-defense, but again, a case could really be made that McCready is more of an anti-hero. The anti-hero or the reluctant hero is sort of a recurring theme that you see throughout a lot of John Carpenter's films. Now, an interesting character detail about McCready is because we constantly see him drinking throughout the film, while it's never said flat out, it is heavily implied that he's an alcoholic. Now, I've never read Bill Lancaster's original script for the film, but supposedly in an earlier draft of the script, it was revealed that McCready was actually a helicopter pilot in Vietnam, and it's implied that he was heavily traumatized by his experiences in Vietnam, and that's why he's an alcoholic. While that is an interesting detail, it's not necessarily needed for the film. And I like how it's more implied rather than said flat out. You also have Keith David as Childs, and it's a great performance, and Childs is also a great character. And what I find interesting about Childs is... In some ways, you could look at him as both the secondary protagonist of the film. At the same time, it could be argued that he is kind of an antagonist, because even though he's not an evil person, he does become McCready's chief rival throughout the film. And it's sort of implied that even before the thing entered their lives, these two did not get along at all. Now, Keith David would work with John Carpenter again in They Live, and I actually met Keith David back in 2014 at sort of a They Live reunion slash Q&A. I remember a lot of people were asking him about The Thing, and he brought up how the film got really negative reviews at the time it came out, and he mentioned how he was reading one of the reviews that said, you can't take your family to go see it, as if that was a negative about the film, and Keith David said, then don't take your damn family to go see it. But that is an example of how the success of Steven Spielberg's E.T. really did negatively impact the success of The Thing. You also have Wilford Brimley as Blair, another really memorable performance, and Blair is really the first person to figure out what's going on and what this thing is capable of, and you see this character go completely insane in the film, especially when he realizes that if this thing does make it to civilization, it could potentially be the extinction of the human species. So when you think about it, he's absolutely right for going as crazy as he does. In a weird way, even though he's acting so crazy, you could almost say that he's the most sane out of all of them because he realizes the implications of this thing. And that's a very Lovecraftian aspect of the story, this idea that a little knowledge 
could drive a person insane. You also have T.K. Carter as Nulls. You also have David Clennon as Palmer, who in some ways kind of steals the movie. Like, Palmer is a really entertaining character. He's sort of this stoner dumbass, and it's also implied that he's sort of a conspiracy theorist. He also has the film's funniest and probably most quoted line, you gotta be fucking kidding. And if you've seen the movie, you know exactly why he says that in the scene where he says it. You also have Richard Dizzard, I'm probably butchering his last name, as Copper, who has probably my favorite line in the movie, somebody got to the blood. You have Charles Hallahan as Norris. You have Peter Maloney as Bennings. You have Richard Mazur as Clark. Richard Mazur would actually go on to play the adult Stan in the 1990 adaptation of Stephen King's It. You have Donald Moffat as Gary. You have Joel Polis as Fuchs. And you have Thomas G. Waits, who also played Fox in The Warriors as Windows. But yeah, the acting in the film is amazing. It's one of the best things about the movie, to be honest. And the actors play so well off of each other. And each actor does an amazing job at making their character feel like a real person. The characters in this movie really do feel like real people. And what I find interesting is you don't get a lot of details about the characters' backstories. At the same time, it never feels like the film is skipping on the character development and the characterization. And you get a real sense that these men have known each other for years, and some of them you could tell are genuinely friends, whereas others you get a sense that they don't really like each other, and you get the idea that this whole situation with the thing is only compounding the dislike that was already there. There's also an uncredited voice cameo from Adrienne Barbeau, who was married to John Carpenter at the time. She actually plays the voice of the computer that McCready is playing chess on in the beginning of the film. Now, Adrienne Barbeau was also in Carpenter's The Fog and Escape from New York, but I've always known her best as Wilma from George Romero and Stephen King's Creepshow. But a lot of people of my generation would probably recognize her best as the voice of Catwoman from Batman the Animated Series. And Rob Bottin's makeup and special effects in this movie is just freaking masterful. Like, there's a reason people still reference the thing today when talking about practical effects in movies, because this is one of the best examples of practical effects. This is a 40-year-old movie, and the special effects in this film still hold up today, and in fact, looks better than some movies today. If I had to be nitpicky, there are maybe one or two moments where you could kinda tell it's a special effect. For example, there's a scene where a character who's revealed to be an alien, his neck starts stretching out, and you can kinda tell it's rubber, but literally that's just me being a nitpicky bastard. Most of the effects in this film really do hold up, because when I watch this movie, I don't see special effects. I see some kind of an alien monster. I see these horrible, horrific mutations. Like, Rob Bottin does a great job at making the effects look real. He also does a good job at making the different forms that the thing takes on look truly alien. But the different forms that you see the creature take on in the film, none of these are actually its true form. It might not even have a true form. In fact, its original form, when it began its life cycle, might have been no more than a microscopic organism, but over time, it's assimilated all these different life forms throughout the universe, and I like the idea that this thing has been to thousands of planets before eventually reaching Earth and has probably assimilated thousands of different alien civilizations. 
And the forms that you see it take on in the film are actually these horribly mutated versions of the human body, almost like a parody of the human body. And the thing really is a fascinating and terrifying monster because it's simultaneously a monster and a virus at the same time. It's simultaneously one creature and multiple creatures at the same time. And I gotta say, the scene where it's revealed that the dog was an alien, like, that scene is fucking terrifying. And in that scene, you briefly cut to McCready at another part of the base getting a beer, and then he hears the cries of the dogs in the kennel, and the scream of this alien dog, and it is fucking bone-chilling, the sound of it, like, echoing across the base. And John Carpenter's The Thing really is successful at being not just a great monster movie, but also a thought-provoking science fiction drama. And the film deals with with a lot of themes of isolation and the breakdown of the human body and loss of control of the body, this is very much a body horror film. And both this and the original short story, Who Goes There by John Campbell, really is about trust and how fragile trust is and how easily trust can be broken. Now, the film came out in 1982, which was when the AIDS crisis was really in its infancy and some people have seen the film as sort of an allegory for the AIDS crisis, which at the time, AIDS was a virus that we barely understood. I don't know if that was intentional or not, because again, the movie is based on a story that was written all the way back in the 1930s, but it wouldn't surprise me either if maybe Carpenter was trying to make some allusions to the AIDS epidemic, but at the same time, I don't think there's anything wrong with finding subtext in a movie that maybe was not originally intended to be there. Now, when I was younger and I would watch this movie, I used to think that the thing would simply just eat somebody and then take on the form of whoever it eats, and it would, like, absorb their intelligence and memories so it could act like that person. And I used to think that was it, that this thing would simply take on human form and put on an act for the people around it, and I used to think that it was purposefully pitting these men against each other. But it wasn't a until I was older and a friend of mine pointed this out to me that what if this thing is able to imitate humans so well that it actually convinces itself it is human for the brief period that it's taken on that form and its true self only comes out when it's threatened. So if that's the case, what if like the people who are the thing have no idea that they're the thing? And that in a way is a very nihilistic idea. Like, it's basically asking, what does it mean to be human in the face of something that could imitate humans so perfectly? Like, what if everything we think makes us human, everything we think makes humans special and separates us from other species, our thoughts, our beliefs, our personalities, our individuality, what if all of that doesn't really mean shit? What if it's all just chemical reactions in the brain that can easily be replicated. And again, it's a very nihilistic concept. Now, it's one thing if maybe you believe in God or the soul, but Carpenter being an atheist, I don't think he's really taken those concepts into account with this movie. So, what if there is no grand design to the universe? What if the universe is just a cold, emotionless place, and humans are so insignificant compared to the entire of the universe, and what if there's nothing that makes human beings special at all? And that's where you can very much tie it in with the works of H.P. Lovecraft. Now, Lovecraft really did sort of popularize the subgenre of cosmic horror, and I think The Thing might actually be the best cosmic horror film ever made, and it's not even based on anything by Lovecraft, at least not directly. I did hear that Who Goes There was loosely inspired inspired by H.P. 
Lovecraft's At the Mountains of Madness, so even back then, this story has always had kind of a Lovecraft connection. Now, if for some reason you have not yet watched John Carpenter's The Thing, I am giving you fair warning that I'm about to talk about the ending of the movie, because the ending is one of the most debated and analyzed parts of the film, so I feel like I would be remiss not to talk about it. Now, what the film ends on a very downbeat and ambiguous note. Basically, at the end of the film, McCready has blown up the entire base and appears to have killed the thing. And then Childs shows up, and it appears that McCready and Childs are the only two survivors of what happened. But here's the thing, Childs did disappear for a while, so both McCready and we as the audience don't know if Childs is a thing or not. And there's been so much analysis and debate about the film's ending. You could find so many articles and videos online talking about the ending. Some of them talking about how, oh, this is proof that Childs was the thing. But truth be told, I don't want definitive proof that Childs was the thing. I don't think the ending needs a definitive answer. Like, I don't want to know if Childs was the thing or if even McCready was the thing if we go with that theory that people People who are the thing don't even realize it. I like that the ending is ambiguous, and as far as I'm concerned, anything that happens to the characters off-screen, unless it's explicitly stated in the movie itself, anything that happens to these characters off-screen is completely up to us. Now, I sometimes listen to this podcast called The Projection Booth, and they did an episode on The Thing, and one of the guest hosts in that episode brought up a really good point about the ending, that it would actually be more profound if neither one of them was The Thing. Because think about it, this little society that these characters have been living in for however long has completely collapsed, and they're the only two survivors of this catastrophe and they're both most likely going to freeze to death in the snow. It's a moment where they should be comforting each other, but instead, even after all of that, they still can't trust each other. And if that really is the case, what a profound statement about society in general, and it really would tie in with the themes of the thing, if neither one of them was the thing. Like, even though the characters did technically win in the end, this thing took something from them that can never be replaced, and that was trust. Now, the year this came out, 1982, there was actually a novelization of the thing, by Alan Dean Foster, who also did the novelizations for the Alien movies, and I know he did several Star Wars novelizations as well. I actually have the novelization, but I haven't read it yet. I was actually thinking about reading this for this review, so I could do kind of like a comparison between the movie and the novelization, but frankly, I have so many other things on my reading list that I was never going to find the time to read it for this this video, but I might do a standalone review on the novelization at some point in the future. Now, what John Carpenter considers the thing to be the first part of what he calls the Apocalypse Trilogy. The other two films in this trilogy are Prince of Darkness and In the Mouth of Madness. It's called the Apocalypse Trilogy because all three films are about the characters having the fight against something that could bring about the end of the world as we know it, and and all three films are also heavily influenced by H.P. Lovecraft. Now, Dark Horse actually did a comic book series called The Thing from Another World, which was obviously taking its title from the 1950s film, even though the comics acted as a sequel to the John Carpenter film. Now, I've never read the comics, but apparently they do pick up where the movie left off, but that also depends on whether or not you want to count the comics as actually being canon. The movie also had some video game adaptations. Now, now, in 2011, there was actually a prequel to The Thing, simply titled The Thing. It was promoted as a remake, but it was actually a prequel to the John Carpenter film. It was about what happened at the Norwegian base prior to the events of this movie. 
I've never seen it, and truth be told, I don't really have much of a desire to see it, because as far as I'm concerned, anything that I imagine happened at the Norwegian base prior to the events of this movie, like, anything that I imagine in my head is far more terrifying than anything that they could show you in the movie. I know Mary Elizabeth Weinstead is in it, who's an actress I like a lot, but I think her character is supposed to be American, and truth be told, it's like... A movie about what happened at the Norwegian base should focus on Norwegian characters. Like, it should just be all Norwegian with English subtitles. I think that would have been a far more interesting movie, to be honest. The movie also has Joel Edgerton, another actor that I like a lot. There was also a short story called The Things by Peter Watts, which was apparently a retelling of the John Carpenter film, but it was told from the point of view of the creature. Now, in 2018, an earlier draft of John Campbell's Who Goes There was discovered that was apparently close to novel length, and it was published under the title Frozen Hell. And apparently Blumhouse is developing an adaptation of the Frozen Hell version of the story. It would be interesting if they're going to actually call it The Thing, or if they're going to call it Frozen Hell, or even Who Goes There. Whether this Blumhouse movie turns out to be good or bad, you know there's going to be inevitable comparisons to the John Carpenter film, even though, from what I understand, it's not meant to be a straight remake, it's meant to be just another adaptation of the same story. Now, despite not doing well when it first came out, the thing would eventually find its life on home video, and eventually critics would reevaluate the film, and now it's considered to be a classic and one of the most influential horror films of the 1980s. And you can see the influence of The Thing on so much in pop culture. There was an early episode of The X-Files called Ice, which had a very similar premise to that of The Thing and Who Goes There. There was an episode of Star Trek The Next Generation called Aquiel, which featured an alien that was very similar to that of The Thing. And in speaking of Star Trek, the main villains of Star Trek Deep Space Nine were this alien race called the Changelings, who even though they didn't, like, consume other life forms like the thing, they were able to perfectly imitate other life forms, and in the show you saw that they kidnapped certain people from Starfleet and took on the forms of said people. And there's an episode of DS9 called The Adversary, which borrows heavily from both Who Goes There and the Carpenter film. In Godzilla 2000, Godzilla fought an alien monster called Orga that at one point was trying to eat Godzilla and then take on the form of Godzilla, and I wouldn't be surprised if Orga was maybe inspired by the thing. There are also a lot of references to this movie in Stranger Things, which is ironic considering that Stranger Things was also inspired by E.T., and Carpenter blames E.T. for the film's failure. There was also a direct parody and homage to the You Gotta Be Kidding Me scene from The Thing in It Chapter 2. You could also see the influence of The Thing on a movie like It Follows. The Thing is also an influence on filmmakers like J.J. Abrams, Guillermo del Toro, Edgar Wright, and Quentin Tarantino. In fact, Quentin Tarantino's 2015 film, The Hateful Eight, which was another movie with Kurt Russell in it, includes a lot of really interesting references and parallels to The Thing, even though that's a Western film with no sci-fi elements at all. Like, The Hateful Eight does focus on a group of people in one small location, and somebody there is not who they say they are, and nobody trusts each other, and the movie also does include some of Ennio Morricone's music from The Thing, so in a weird way, you could almost call The Hateful Eight sort of a spiritual remake of The Thing. You could also see the influence of The Thing on people like Junji Ito. In fact, a lot of imagery from Junji Ito's mangas reminds me of imagery from The Thing. But yeah, The Thing is an amazing movie, and it's definitely one of the best sci-fi horror films of not just the 1980s, but of all time, and again, I really do think this is John Carpenter's masterpiece. I know some people might disagree with me, but in my personal opinion, it's Carpenter's best film. Now, this is 
the last point in the video where you're going to see me, but now I want to cut to some friends of mine giving their thoughts on Carpenter's The Thing. The first person you're going to hear from is Esley Greer from Entertainment Fanatic Reviews. You're also going to see some other familiar faces, like my friend Bill Burns, my friend Jeremy, my friend Kara, who was in my Frankenstein review, my friend Mark Allen Gunnels, and some other familiar faces as well. Hey, how's it going? My name is Esley Greer from Entertainment Fanatic Reviews, and I want to thank Christian over at Canto 1408 for letting me talk about John Carpenter's The Thing, which, quick story before we get into it, I have actually never seen John Carpenter's The Thing until the other month when it came out on... 4K. And if you haven't seen it in 4K, I highly recommend it. And if you're a first time viewer of this film as well, best place to check it out is on 4K Ultra HD Blu ray. As long as I've been on YouTube and as long as I've been into horror, everyone kept telling me that John Carpenter's A Thing is one of the best horror movies of all time. And every time someone says something like that, I usually end up disappointed with said film. But in this case, while I don't love it as much as other people do, I wasn't disappointed by it in the slightest, which was a relief on my end. So um, the way that this is going to work out, I'm going to talk about my negatives, the mix aspects, and then work my way up to the positives. So first thing I want to talk about is the character of Blair, which he was a red flag to begin with. Even before the thing got to him, he just gave off red flags, or maybe the thing got to him before it got to everyone else, but still. And I also want to mention something that this is a negative for me. It's a negative for my wife because she couldn't finish the film after this scene happened, but the scene with the dogs and everything when the thing exploded from the dog, that really got to her, and so she just didn't want to finish the movie, which I championed on because everyone kept telling me this was great, and the practical effects in that scene was phenomenal. So with that said, let's move on on to the mixed aspects of this film. I guess this can work in the positives as well because I will mention it, but the ending to me is very mixed to me because we don't get an answer for who the thing is at the end of the film, which um, both Childs and McCready gave off red flags, so you don't know who the thing is towards the ending of the film, and it keeps you guessing, sort of like the ending to The Shining. There was an alternate ending that was never released, I don't believe, but it was filmed where McCready made it out, and um, it was a good ending, but they stuck with the, you know bittersweet ending I guess where you don't really know who the thing is and you know both characters die but the thing doesn't take over the population so that's great so another thing that I mixed on while I do bring up the special effects and the positives there is one thing or a couple of things that looked a little bit iffy to me that has to be the stop motion which I give massive respect to people that work with stop motion, which that takes a lot of time and effort to do that. So I'm not shitting on the creators. I just, at times, I'm turned off by stop motion, um, which there are some great stop motion films, which, you know, that I'm a fan of. But when you have a film full of practical effects, you know, that's used on screen with actors and everything, and then you use stop motion, that sort of gets to me, but massive respect to everyone involved. And another thing that I mix on is this other practical effect used where Blair puts his fingers through Gary's face. That just looked a little bit weird to me, and the first time I saw it, I just laughed my ass off because it just looked so funny. Um, and I've seen that type of death before, but it just always looks goofy to me. But with that said, on to the positives. And the main thing I want to talk about is the special effects, which is always brought up when talking about John Carpenter's The Thing. Um, another thing I want to bring up is the cast, because their chemistry is some of the best that I've ever seen in horror history, because you've got certain characters that like each other and don't like each other, and so there's this certain tension throughout the film with certain characters that I couldn't get enough of. And another thing that this film does perfectly is this great sense of isolation, because, you know, they're out in Antarctica, thousands of miles away from any living person and so the landscape and setting is perfect for this type of film and you know it's just these 12 characters in this film and I don't know I just think it does a really good job at having this sense of isolation and has you on the edge of your toes throughout most of the film um, another thing that it does great is you know it keeps you guessing as who the thing is which I've watched this film three times already you know back when I first watched it a couple of months ago and then with a friend and then for this review so I try and pick up on things that I didn't on the first time watch with, you know, trying to figure out who the thing is and how they became the thing. So it's great at what it does with that. The last thing I want to talk about is the music, which it wasn't scored by John Carpenter because 
with this film, I'm sure he had a lot to manage and, you know, to do on this film. So, like, the music would probably be another thing, you know, on his shoulders. So, I'm going to mispronounce this name because I don't even know how to say it. So, the composer for this film is Ennio Morricone. I don't know if that's how you pronounce it. I should have looked it up, but, yeah, there's this certain... There's a certain music cue that happens throughout the film where it's like, da-dun, da-dun. I really like the way that that's played out, and it has this great sense of tension. Um, and it builds up to some really great iconic scenes, um, you know, particularly the blood test scene and the ending and a few others. There's just some really creepy moments that make up for those iconic scenes. So um, if I had to score this film, I would have to give it an 87%, which I know a lot of people give this like a 99 or a hundred percent, but I had a few flaws with it. Um, but like I said, I wasn't disappointed at all with this film and I get why some people say it's one of the greatest of all time. If I give it a couple or more watches, I might be in that boat. So I want to thank you so much, Christian, for letting me take part in this John Carpenter's The Thing review. And with that said, I'll see you guys in the next one. Hello out there. My friend Christian has asked me to do a short review on the movie John Carpenter's The Thing. And um, it's actually one of my favorite films. Uh, I actually think it's possibly one of the best sci-fi horror films that has ever been made. Um, and it has that reputation among most fans of the genre, and um, which is, you know, ironic, but also wonderful, because at the time of its release in the early 80s, um, it was not well reviewed, and it was a box office flop, which just goes to prove that you can't go by the initial response to something when it comes to how much it's going to become beloved, because it is a beloved film. I mean, Carpenter does everything right here. I mean, the film works on all levels, from the acting to the execution of the storyline to the special effects. Um, I can't say enough about it, and even though it, it's a great alien story with some of the best practical special effects that still hold up today, what really makes the film work is that the real villain of the piece isn't the actual alien, but the paranoia. Um, the characters realizing they don't know who to trust. They don't know if the person beside them, the person they've known for possibly years, isn't who they seem to be. And that works um, on a couple of different levels. It works for the film because of the storyline of the alien that can replicate and mimic other people or other life forms. Um, but it also works on a metaphorical level, um, just how we sometimes feel we don't know who to trust and we don't know how much people are being honest with us about who they are. So it works on those different levels that really elevates the film. Um, but, I mean, it plays out wonderfully. It builds suspense. It builds that paranoia. So you start to feel it, feel it as well. Um, like I said, the special effects are spectacular. Um, there's some really grotesque and disturbing imagery. But there's also a great atmosphere um, and tension that the film builds. And it, it ends with a note of ambiguity, which I think makes it even more effective because that lingers in your mind because you, the characters that are there at the end aren't sure if they should trust each other. And we're not sure as the audience if we should trust either of them. Um, I think it's just a pitch perfect film. And I can't recommend it enough. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Bill, and Christian has asked me to talk a little bit about John Carpenter's The Thing. Um, I first saw The Thing, I guess I was like 10 or 11 or 12 years old in that in that range. And I think I rented it on, on VHS from the days where you would go to the video store and rent uh, films. And I, I already had loved Carpenter. Like, I had seen The Fog. I had seen Halloween. I had seen um, Escape from New York. So I was, I was already, like, a big Carpenter fan. And I could already identify him as having certain themes and a certain look to his films and the soundtrack. Maybe the, one of the first directors I ever sort of could pick out their films. But nothing could prepare me for the thing like it started out like kind of like your you know your regular kind of sci-fi monster film and then just the, the the special effects 
the the look of the film, the the the, the ending, which is so bleak, it just blew me away. And I just I remember. I, as soon as I was done with the movie, I popped it out, I put it in the rewinder, I rewound it, and watched it again immediately after. I didn't even wait in between. I just, like, I had to see it again. And I think one of the reasons I really like, was so shocked by it was obviously the special effects, right? Because in most um, uh, sci-fi horror monster movies, the monster is pretty much humanoid, right? It has, like, two arms, two legs, a chest, a head. So it, it kind of resembles, in some ways, a, a, a human in some ways, you know? And in this film, right, the alien really took on so many different fluid shapes and it, it, it like it, it's 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 liquid with, with the with the blood test and then it like it pops out of chests and it, it just evolved it, it was just i couldn't believe it like i could not believe the the level of special effects right rob botan right who who did the special effects for it i mean he did an amazing job i mean just you you really think you're seeing something alien something that's not from this planet that does not take on the shape of a human being as its frame of reference. I mean, obviously, it 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 it, it masqueraded as human beings, but the uh, other forms of it, right, ha- had no connection to any humanoid forms. So I think that was one of the things in the film that really kind of shocked me. Right, was this idea that you know usually I would think of villains and monsters as basically humanoid, right? And they have a head, and that's where you would sort of you know attack to you know. And there was you couldn't do that with this creature. It could be so many different shapes and forms. It did not have one kind of absolute structure. It just it it, it was truly a thing. Like you could not describe it. You could not pin it down. You couldn't classify. It. You couldn't categorize it. It was truly this sort of amorphous kind of, you know, being that we could not wrap our heads around. It was outside of the human frame of reference. I think that's where you really get the, the, the connection to Lovecraft. I know a lot of people see this film as a very Lovecraftian film. And um, I think that's where you really get it. The idea that alien um, uh, beings would not necessarily uh, take the form or, or, or have the same structure as a human, right? We, even though, you know, Copernicus came along and said that, you know, that the Earth is not the center of the universe, right? I think a lot of humans still think that way, that we are the absolute sort of structure. We are the absolute sort of model for all other life, right? Everything has to look like humans because we're at the top of the food chain. We're at the top of, you know, the, uh, the, the consciousness of, of our planet. But that does not mean that in other planets and in other worlds that that's going to be the frame of reference, that that's going to be the structure. So again, this sort of idea of cosmic, uh, sort of, the, you know, the cosmic horror, the sort of indifference to human significance, right? This alien couldn't care less that we are human beings, right? It's just trying to survive and it's going to survive the best way it can, right? By sort of mimicking what human beings look like. And uh, it fools us. Obviously, it fools the people in the film. And it works because it, very quickly this uh, alien being takes over, right? And sort of and, and expresses itself as a superior being to humans, right? And so to me, uh, that really is the central theme of the film, right? Like this idea of we like to think that as human beings, we're all unique. We're all individuals. There's things about us that are only uh, uh, that only we could have some essence, some consciousness that uh, is our own domain that makes me me. That nobody else is like me. I'm this way, you know, and I am. You know, and there's something sort of innate within us that makes us individuals and uh, makes us sort of have this sort of absolute uh, understanding of who we are and our place in the universe. And in the thing, we learn we are so easily. Copyable. We are so easily um, sort of uh, uh, copied and sort of um, duplicated that there is nothing within us that is truly unique. There is nothing in, within us that is sort of individual, right? There, that is the ultimate horror, right? To realize that we aren't important. We aren't meaningful. That we could be copied. We could be sort of imitated so easily that it's not even funny. Right. There's no sort of, you know, uh, connection to a, an ultimate power or a higher power that makes all of us unique. And in our relationships with that higher power, that's what gives our lives meaning and, 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 and sort of significance. And in this film, there is no right. There is nothing within us that the alien that the, the thing can't copy. 
right? It could copy everything. How do we know that we're not already copies? How do we know that millions of years ago that an alien just like this, the thing didn't take over some other, you know, land somewhere else and copy us? How do we know that we're not copies? How do we know that we're original? We have original essence. And this film really sort of gets at that. And that's, I think, the ultimate horror of the film is that we can't never know that. We don't know if we're copies. We don't know if this is there somebody else in the world that looks exactly like us, acts just like us. Who knows? And to me, that's really the horror. I mean, obviously, I wouldn't want my, you know, chest ripped open and the things that happen to the people. But I think that the real horror of the film is metaphysical, right? The real horror is existential. The idea that there is nothing that makes us unique. There's nothing that makes us sort of, you know, one in a billion, right? We're just like everybody else. And we can easily be uh, copied. And to me, that's the real horror of it. And that's the genius of it. And I think that's one of the things that people couldn't put their heads around when they saw the film originally, when it originally came out. Right? That, again, they, especially the American audiences where we're sort of raised to believe that we're Americans. We're unique. You know, we're important. We're special. Every individual matters. And here's a film that's telling us that's not true at all. So in some ways, it's interesting. You could think about it also as a metaphor, I guess, for maybe like a communist kind of, you know, this idea of people have this weird idea that socialism, communism makes everybody the same. Right. It doesn't make everybody equal. But there's this idea that we've been told that, you know, it makes everybody the same. And here we have an actual uh, situation where everybody does become the same in some ways. So those are my thoughts about uh, John Carpenter's The Thing. I think it's a brilliant film. I think it's one of the greatest horror films ever made. Um, even though there are other films that I like more than I still think that The Thing is John Carpenter's greatest film. Hello everyone, Christian asked what my thoughts and opinions are about The Thing remake from 1982 directed by John Carpenter. The Thing is one of my favorite horror sci-fi films of all time and also one of my favorite uh, John Carpenter films. Right up there with like Halloween, Prince of Darkness, they Live, and The Fog, etc. I love the original too. I have a re great respect for it. I admire the film. For but this is like one of the few times and rare times where I'm going to be saying that I think the remake is better than the original because of the uh, the updated special effects and also Kurt Russell's performance of this film has been greedy. It's great. It's interesting how like he's the hero of the film, yet he's an alcoholic. And he's also like a real badass. My father introduced me to this movie because this is my father's... Uh, Favorites, and it's very ironic because around the time when this film came out back in 1982, the film was a uh, box office failure, did not do well, was not like well received by critics and audience at the time. And the funny thing is, my father like was one of the like 10 percent people at the time that loved it like right away. He said like after seeing the film, like being in medical school back in the 80s, he said anytime he would like talk to people, make conversation, like oh I just saw this movie, the thing I loved it so much I can't get it out of my head because. He was, like, blown away with the uh, special effects of how, like, amazing well done it was for the film. Even I was blown away by the special effects. I'm thinking, wow. The eight, that was, like, probably one of the first of, like, 80s, like, horror films I watched that introduced me to how great the special effects were back in the 80s. That scene when the guy's, like, arms are chopped up, or, like, bitten off. I'll never forget the first time I saw this. I'm thinking to myself, wow, that is just, like, cool and amazing, like, special effects. I also never get the first time I saw it. my dad was explaining to me how they did it. Apparently they got like some guy with uh with no arms for that scene. He was wearing like a body suit that looked like the guy. The one thing that I always found interesting about McGreedy's character being an alcoholic, I always had this theory that because maybe he never became the thing inside of him, maybe because the aliens like uh, could smell like the alcohol in their system, maybe like the thing aliens could not tolerate alcohol. It's funny as I'm like talking about the thing remake, like I'm wearing a Halloween t-shirt, which is my favorite horror movie of all time. Actually, what's funny is uh, my father, both their favorite horror films is done by the same director, John Carpenter. My dad loves the thing and I love Halloween. When you watch the original Halloween film, the part like when the kids are in the family were watching television, they're watching the thing from another world. And it's funny how like, when people like watch Halloween today, they think to themselves, that's a foreshadow there for that time, how John Carpenter would go on to direct The Thing remake a few years later in the 80s. A little spoiler right here about the ending. It's one of my favorite, like, uh, cliffhanger endings in a horror film. I just love it how, like, you have, like, McGreen and Keith David there saying that we'll wait for a little while. And then it just ends, like, right there. So that was my review of The Thing remake. Hope you liked and enjoyed it. And thank you once again, Christian, for asking my thoughts and opinions about The Thing remake. John Carpenter's The Thing. What a movie. What an absolutely haunting opus of a movie all practical effects sometimes no soundtrack sometimes intense violins so what did i like about it before we get into you know some nitty-gritty what i liked about it what didn't i like about it everyone talks about the practical effects but that's 
jumping the gun. This movie has a haunting way of building up such an intense atmosphere to feel like you are there, isolated, in this expedition with these ten or so men. Another thing I see brought up to this film is that there are no women. It's a very interesting development that they did in the movie, and I'm sure that was intentional. This movie is a very intentional film. <laughs> Redundant. This film is very intentional. So everything, music choices, characters, is very deliberate. You get to have an inkling about who these people are, just glimpses of their personality. We don't have time to delve into everyone in the expedition. That's my cat. <laughs> um, but we get inklings of what these people are like. One of them likes dogs a lot and gets really torn up when a certain something happens to said dog. If you're a fan of um, animals, even if they're practical effects, this movie does come with a sort of warning. Um, cruelty. <laughs> and I'll leave it at that. This movie is a masterclass at both sci-fi and horror. I, I say horror weird, but horror just sounds weird. Personally, I've never found horror to be very scary. There are definitely elements I get scared by, things that linger at night. I'm the kind of person that got scared by the Hills of Eyes. That's a terrifying prospect. But the thing? Alien? A lot of possibilities and a lot of sci-fi. Sci-fi covers a lot of possibilities. That's what this movie does. It plays with your trust issues. It plays on the what-ifs. <laughs> and... I find sci-fi infinitely more terrifying. This movie not only took me there atmosphere-wise, but it took me there effect-wise. The effects, the very infamous but also famous effects used in this movie are one in a million. The effort put in, I analyze a lot behind the, behind the scenes, the effort put into this movie, whether they were on location, whether it was fake snow, I don't know, all of it looks really believable. This is no by no means a perfect film, but it is a very well done film and manages to have an excellent slow burn. Though certain effects are on the screen only for, I don't know, not even five minutes? <laughs> certain segments of effects, and that's all I'm going to say, certain segments of effects are used, you know, brilliantly. It doesn't feel like it's a waste when it's on screen. Some things may look more gelatinous and juicy and fake than other things, but every time a certain grotesque thing is on screen, I never felt like it was a waste. I felt like, wow, there was effort here. I don't care how campy or goofy it looks, it, it, the build-up manages to engross you, the viewer, when you see the culmination of what it came to, which is this abomination, or a few. So, some notes I took. A movie that you know from the get-go doesn't end well. I think that was evident from the title. The Thing. What are you supposed to make out of a thing? You don't know what this thing is, where it came from, what it properly looks like. All you know is that it's akin to a virus. And it will spread, and that is its sole purpose. That alone, coming out of the wake of 2020 and COVID, is especially more terrifying, but it was probably just as terrifying back in the 70s or 80s when it was made. This is the one time I hope you don't speak Norwegian, because I've heard that the Norwegian subtitles or the Norwegian actor give a little away, but I think that's what John Carpenter was hoping for. He would probably bank on the fact that his audience doesn't speak Norwegian, or the audience it was being shown to, mainly an American audience. Um, that's all I'm going to say. They're in the Arctic for however long on this expedition. Nobody has responded in two weeks. The dialogue is all craft crafted and set up for you to just feel dread. You know, this is not going to end well. And let's see where it goes. So it's a very interesting ride if you let yourself be pulled in. And I highly recommend it. There's a lot of praises I could sing about this movie, but I'm trying to be a bit more logical. So this movie has a great way of showing, not telling. I said that before. The only time it does start telling 
is in the dialogue when they start having more of an idea of what this thing is and what it can do, but even then they've barely started to scratch the surface on it. Nobody trusts anybody now, and we're all very tired. <laughs> I think that could sum up the past two years, but also that could sum up the movie. This movie is a great example of distrust in a camp, in a group, the one solace you have from the big scary world out there, and it's so unsettling that the big scary world is also in your little microcosm. You can't trust your own team, you can't trust anybody. That's terrifying. And when certain horror films started to be like, the horror is coming from inside the house, very much especially terrifying. The one kin and the bloodline you have can't even be trusted. See movies like, you know, even The Exorcist or Hereditary. Hits very close to home, pun intended. So I guess my notes were more about trying to absorb the story. As someone with auditory processing issues, I need subtitles. I don't know how much I would have retained had I not watched it with subtitles. So I do recommend that for a proper movie experience. You'll hear what everyone's name is, you'll keep better track. That was in my case, can't speak for everybody, but subtitles definitely helped with this film. I appreciate all the detail they put into not only the effects, but the actors gave it their all. They were in their role, they said their dialogue, they said their lines well, but they were believable. When they overreacted, and they were sick of the distrust and all the... When they shouted, you felt it was for a reason. There was pent-up emotion. It was a build. So, I would say that this was an exceptional flick. You know? I had a hard time watching it on my own. <laughs> Even in the first... 20 minutes when things really start to hit the fan, I thought, hmm, I'm afraid. <laughs> this movie does that very well. It instills a lot of fear. It makes you afraid for what could this thing possibly turn into. And if this scenario happened to me, what would I do? <laughs> it brings you along for the ride without breaking the fourth wall, without any cheesy references or anything like that made me question if I was in that scenario how would I know who to trust and distrust and how would I plan certain things out if I can take a concept that a movie does and roll with it way after the credits are rolling I consider it a very good film Christian thank you for having me I love reviewing your uh I love reviewing movies I love reviewing on your channel and godspeed with your channel do what you love and I'm going to keep watching movies that terrify me and make me ask bigger questions. Thanks again. John Carpenter's The Thing is an example of a remake that is better than the original. Now, I love The Thing from Outer Space, the original movie, uh, The Thing, you know. But this one is just, it's so much better. It did everything the original was trying to do and made it better. And it puts you in an atmosphere where you're paranoid, you're scared yourself because you don't know who to trust and you're wondering what the hell is going on and you feel claustrophobic because these people are trapped in a snowbound whatever the hell and who do you trust? Where are you going to go? There's nowhere to go. You can't just like run out and be like, oh, I'm going to try to escape because where are you going to go? You're going to freeze to death or die or whatever. Like It's just crazy. And then the fact that the villain could be anybody. It's like a body snatchers thing. It's just crazy. The thing, the creature, the special effects. God bless the the people who did the special effects in this movie. They are great. They still hold up to today. It's very gory, very violent. But it's beautiful in a way. How sick and twisted it looks. <laughs> I just love it. I think that they did an amazing job with the graphics. Story-wise, like I said, it's just... it's who You just feel like you're stuck in this movie it's crazy how paranoid you get the acting is fantastic you have kurt russell you have keith david keith david is one of my favorite actors ever he's actually my favorite voice actor of all time he voiced spawn he voiced goliath in the gargoyle show he voiced julius in saints row he's just he's a legend 
and he is great in this film. Now, his voice is a little different. That's why you might not recognize him if you don't read the credits because of the fact that his voice is a little different. It's a little lighter than it is when he does his voice acting stuff. But he is fantastic. He does a great job. Kurt Russell is... I mean, he's Kurt Russell. That's all I got to say. You know, so this is a fantastic movie. John Carpenter, the directing in this is... Ooh, the editing is great. Everything about it. This movie is great. I love it from the opening shot to the last shot where you're not sure of what's going on and there could be a hidden twist in the ending. Like, oh, everything about it. I love this film. So, yeah, I highly recommend the thing. Check it out, please. You will not regret it. Uh, if you are very queasy with gore, I would still say check it out. Because you know what? That's how good this movie is. So, yeah, thank you so much. Bye-bye. All right. So, I am uh, Nicholas Collins. and I'm going to be giving my input on the 1982 John Carpenter film, The Thing. So, 1982's The Thing is a film adaptation of the 1938 short story, Who Goes There?, written by John Campbell Jr., the film, of course, is directed by John Carpenter, written by Bill Lancaster, and stars Kurt Russell as McCready, Wilfred Brimley as Dr. Blair, and Keith David as Childs. The film itself is a remake of the Howard Hawks film The Thing from Another World from the 1950s, and the general premise of the film is a group of scientists and workers in Antarctica doing research uncover this alien from the ice. The alien can perfectly assimilate into other life forms, including dogs and humans, and if this thing gets back to Earth, right, it'll be this end of humanity. The group needs to decipher who's a thing and who's not a thing, which of course increases tension and paranoia at the base camp. And the team members increasingly begin to distrust one another and paranoia ensues, right? We don't know who's a thing and who's not a thing, who's been infected and who's not infected. So while the film today is considered a horror classic, it opened up in 1982 as a commercial failure, large in part due to the co-release of Steven Spielberg's E.T. the Extraterrestrial, which of course had a different take on Alien Visitation. It was dubbed as sort of an alien knockoff and wouldn't receive wide stream success until the home video market really took off. So I'll never forget personally the first time I saw the thing. So I was at a horror convention with an appearance by John Carpenter and was going to meet him the following day. So I think this was a Friday or something like this. And I was always told, you have to watch the thing. It's one of the best films ever made and things like that. Um, but I neglected it until there was a screening at the show. And so I, you know, sat down for the uh, showtime. And one thing I'll never forget is that eerie sort of opening score with that heartbeat, right? And then the big sort of opening um, in that so it's snowy landscape, right, with the helicopters and they're shooting at that dog, right? And I think I really was sort of hooked uh, from that moment on. So the next day I ran out and immediately purchased a Thing poster for John Carpenter to sign and got to tell him, of course, about my first experiences with it. Uh, which is something, obviously, he's not used to hearing uh, someone first seeing that film. So let me start off first by saying that the film is in most ho uh, horror fans' top five films of the genre, and I agree. So it truly transcended genre boundaries. The score of the film, uh, both by John Carpenter and Ennio Morricone, uh, perfectly complements the tone masterfully. So in particular, again, like I said, that opening scene had that sort of uh, the opening score of the film really has that sort of irregular, sort of almost alien-like heartbeat, right? And then you have this opening white snow covering the screen, and we're already sort of, as an audience, sort of projecting our fears onto this white, snowy, blank canvas landscape, right? And I think one thing that John Carpenter particularly always does well is sort of play with this wide versus a more narrow camera lens to make the audience feel claustrophobic or isolated, Right, and the cinematography here by legendary Dean Cundey is, of course, masterful. Right, so in this film, right, there's a lot of close camera angles followed by w wide camera angles to both have this sort of claustrophobic and this feeling of we're alone in this really vast um, wintry landscape. And so I think balancing those two really well is something John Carpenter has always done well. Uh, one thing that really comes to mind is Escape from New York, right? Those really big sort of wide-angle shots of things moving in the distance. Or in Halloween, right? Those really close-up angles in the closet scene. So I think John Carpenter 
Um, one thing that makes him the legend that he is is not only his musical scores that accompany all of these things really well, but this play of sort of this wide versus narrow camera angle to really convey his story. Of course, you can't really talk about The Thing without talking about the practical effects by Rob Bottin, which were, of course, also really incredible and amazing and perhaps some of the best we've ever seen. So in particular, right, one thing that always comes to mind is that defibrillator scene um, where you have things like the head spider and all those oozing sort of gunky bodily fluids. Um, that are really gruesome and really well done. The performances by the cast were all really amazing. Kurt Russell does an amazing job here. Uh, Keith David does an amazing job here. I don't feel like any performance was better or worse than the other. And I feel like while there wasn't a ton of time to get into all of the characters' backstories to make me like heavily invested in them, we did have a lot of unique um, sort of personalities shine through. Um, just through some various sort of scenes of day-to-day -day sort of at this camp. And we really don't get the sense that any of these characters are in this like really tight-knit friendship either, right? So there is this paranoia that's building and then, then this mistrust and all of these things, um, but we never felt like they had this sort of harmonious relationship to begin with. And I really um, appreciated and enjoyed that sort of take on things, that there's not this sort of universal camaraderie uh, among these workers. So the film really at its core tackles themes of isolation, body horror, and the fear of losing one's identity. Right, so while critics compared this film to Alien, of course, the one key element that differentiate, differentiates them, excuse me, is the creature in this film really lives inside of us and doesn't have a known shape. Right, it's not some extrinsic xenomorphic force that we can assign a name and a clear motive to. As such, whereas in Alien characters come together to fight the monster, and the thing, they really can't do that. There isn't a clear way to detect who in the group is already contaminated, right? They sort of come up with a method, right? But it's not very clear if that's scientifically accurate. So safety is no longer in numbers here, right? So and typically, right, this going all the way back to Frankenstein's monster, right? Sort of this group mentality of defeating the creature, right? We need to come together, join forces, work together to defeat evil. Here, safety is an isolation, right? It's locking yourself in a room and avoiding contact. So it can be argued that the researchers themselves don't even know that they've been infected. So they can't even trust their own bodies, right? There's this mistrust of your own body and your own identity. So there's no longer any place left to hide, right? It's not clear if they're living their lives for themselves with their own motives and goals, or if these have been taken over by something unidentifiable, right? So we begin to lose our trust in ourselves, and I think that that really differentiates this film from a lot of other horror at the time and really makes it something special. So John Carpenter famously said, right, that there are two different stories in horror, the internal and the external. So in external horror films, the evil comes from the outside, the other tribe, this thing in the darkness that we don't understand, this monster under the bed, right? And the internal is the human heart. And this film really contends with the blend of external and internal, right? So what happens when we lose control of the internal by this unbeknownst to humans, strong external alien-like force, right? And John Carpenter really projects this loss of autonomy, self-identity, and we no longer can trust what makes us human. So in a day where the game Among Us was downloaded over 324 million times, it surprises me that there hasn't been a stronger resurgence of love for this 1982 horror classic. Nonetheless, The Thing is a 10-star film that truly transcends the genre boundaries, and it'll be a film that I really re-watch and watch for years to come. So my thoughts on the movie. When I first watched it, I was too young to really uh, enjoy the movie because every five minutes my parents would stop me and avert my eyes to some of the grotesque imagery in it. But, you know, over the years and me actually getting a chance to glimpse it, I really love the movie and I really appreciate the amount of dread that the movie displayed. Even during the time, even like, you know, I, I have these things where I really don't get scared of with a lot of old 80s movies, but um, I can understand why that one's a very dreadful movie. It puts you in a very isolated state. It puts you in a in a state of um, of paranoia, where the closest people that you build a relationship for such a long time can, you know, can turn out to be uh, your enemies with circumstances that would that would you know disrupt their the rational thinking. It it also it also puts you in a state of um, what you're willing to do 
you know, in order to survive. The claustrophobia, I like the setting. It's never in a different location. If anything, it would be very minute scenes of them being outside. But majority of the time, it's in there. You know, the way the movie starts off when you have these Norwegians trying to shoot down the husky. I, I was sitting there watching when I was re-watching the movie with Christian. Um, I was like, damn, you know what? If this movie were to came out on theaters, I wouldn't really understand what the, the beginning story, you know, the beginning part, part of the story was about. You know, with these Norwegians and they're gunning down this animal. They're going to great lengths in a helicopter just to shoot down a husky, you know, and I'm scratching my head puzzling like if I if I was in the time where this movie was being was debuted, what was what would be my opinion? And to piece the to piece the things together, that would have been a very exciting feeling, you know, if if I were to first lay glance on this movie during that time period. You know, overall, I really love this movie. I really love the ending of it. Normal horror movies have this thing where where the people who survive traumatic events that occurs, where, whether it's, a, it's an event, whether it's a, a murderer, a killer, some type of creature, some type of a plague, some type of anything. The characters would create a bond in these movies after going through such experience but these characters they they do have a trusting bond but at the same time is very distant you know it's like they still don't know they have no knowledge of what's going on though they did piece the, some things together to sort out who would be affected who is the creature um, pretending to be or or replacing they had these methods, which I think was pretty cool, where they were testing the blood. But at this moment, where both of the both of the characters are pretty much left alive in the end, they still don't trust each other. They still keep a certain distance, and they don't even know if they're going to survive. I just love the way that that movie ended. I wouldn't really count the prequel. You know, I, I think it the prequel gave too much answers i i like the fact that i didn't know what was what was going on and what was that creature you know i didn't need a prequel to give me an answer to it you know i i think that it should this movie shouldn't be touched at all it it should just be left the way it is no remakes no nothing this is a classic that that people should just come back to watch filmmakers or or future filmmakers should take notes because it it really has every great element of horror. You know, you have the betrayal of friends. Your closest friends could be your enemies in the turn of a dime. Based on the scenario, isolation, paranoia, um, claustrophobia, everything is in there. Everything is in there. And an entity that quite intelligent. You can you you can you can see from some of the tactics and some of the things that this these this thing does that it has a quite ex like extended experience doing this and you could you could see it you know displaying this movie for some of the routes it takes some of the um the uh people it decides to um you know it it's an amazing movie so that's my take on the thing i love the movie i, I actually would like to see it again really good movie really extremely good movie John Carpenter's The Thing is an amazingly effective science fiction slash horror movie. It's very tense throughout, and the tension only gets higher and higher as the movie goes on. The setting is perfect. An isolated research center in the middle of Antarctica, in which these men are cut off from the rest of society and at the mercy of this malevolent alien shapeshifter. As the thing kills and takes over the bodies of several of the men, fear and paranoia takes over as they become increasingly suspicious of each other. The first thing I want to mention is that the sound in this movie is very well done, whether it's the musical score by Ennio Morricone, I hope I'm pronouncing that name right, or just the sound of the howling wind outside, it's all done to great effect. In fact, there's a shot right after Clark has put a dog in the kennel with the other dogs, and for that brief moment, it's just a shot of the dog just sitting there. But that sound of the wind makes it so creepy 
and it just lets you know that something really bad is about to happen. The sounds the thing makes are terrifying too, especially during the first scene in which we see it transform while it's in the dog kennel. The sound it makes out of its mutated dog head, I gotta say, is bone chilling. And the creature effects by Rob Barton are spectacular. They're so incredibly detailed, and I liked how when the thing is transforming, it's always a slow, agonizing process, and you get to see all the different parts of the body become deformed and grotesque. The cast in this movie is great to watch, especially Kurt Russell as R.J. McReady. I just love his constant no-nonsense, take-charge attitude, and how even though he's the main protagonist, he's not afraid to kill anyone if it means survival, and at one point is even willing to blow them all sky-high with dynamite when they try to turn against him. I had the great pleasure of getting Kurt Russell's autograph back in 2014. I got him to sign a Horror Hound magazine with him on the cover, and let me tell you, it was wasn't easy. All the other graphers were swarming him, and I remember I wanted to ask him about what working with the special effects and the thing was like, but in the heat of the moment, I just blurted out, what was working with the thing like? He responded, it was great. Although he didn't seem that enthusiastic when he said it. And I had to fight to get that magazine signed. And it almost didn't happen because he said, last one, while signing someone's photo, and I pleaded with him to sign my magazine too, and he asked, where's your magazine? And when I showed it to him, he signed it. I actually got the whole thing on video, but I rarely watch it anymore, because honestly, it's kind of embarrassing. I've also had the great privilege of meeting several other people who worked on this movie, such as when I had the honor of meeting director John Carpenter in March of 2018 at Monster Mania. I remember this was before Halloween 2018 was released, so I asked him what he was looking forward to most about the new Halloween movie, and oh, he just looked at me and said, getting paid. That made me laugh, and I had him sign my Halloween poster, and that was great. I also met Wilford Brimley at Monster Mania in March of 2017 and got him to sign a photo of himself in the thing, and I later got my photo with him signed and also got some questions answered by him. Some of them were about the thing. I also met Richard Mazur at that same convention, and he was very nice, although I mainly spoke to him about his role as Stan Uris in Stephen King's It. All of the actors in this movie do a great job. They all portray the sense of fear and paranoia very well. Wilford Brimley does an especially good job at that when his character goes crazy and has a mental breakdown. I also want to mention the late Charles Hallahan as Norris. I like how he plays him as kind of meek, which is, which is great for when it's revealed that he's been assimilated. I also want to mention Donald Moffat as Gary, because in my opinion, he provides what is quite possibly the movie's only comedic moment when he says, I know you gentlemen have been through a lot. But when you find the time, I'd rather not spend the rest of this winter tied to this fucking couch! I like how the thing is portrayed as a creature that's out for its own survival, even if that means splitting up from other parts of itself and leaving them to die. It's also really scary how it operates. I mean, this thing can invade and take over your body and pretend to be you while you die a horrible, slow, painful death in the process. That's a really terrifying concept. This movie is based on the novella Who Goes There by John W. Campbell Jr., and while I haven't read it, I've heard that John Carpenter's adaptation is a lot more faithful to it than 1951's The Thing from Another World, which I've also seen. I will say that it's been a long time since I've seen The Thing from Another World, but I remember it being a pretty good movie. Still, though, I would definitely say that John Carpenter's The Thing is superior to it. From what I remember of the 1951 version, the monster was basically just a walking humanoid killer vegetable, whereas in John Carpenter's version, it's much more horrifying than that. All in all, this is an amazing and terrifying science fiction and horror movie. I love everything about it. The story, the acting, the special effects, the constant sense of dread, the fear of not knowing who you can trust. Even the opening title sequence is nothing short of amazing. If you haven't seen this movie, then I definitely recommend checking it out as soon as possible. I'll wrap it up here. I hope you're all doing well and that you enjoyed my review. Take care.